Neanderthals were here, say, 2,000 generations ago. If they would have made it another 2,000 generations, how would we have dealt with them? Would they live in zoos or would they live in suburbia? When Svante Pebo talks about how close we came to living in a state of coexistence with Neanderthals, it makes you realise that our vision of ourselves as top species and like the end of evolution perhaps, which is obviously wrong, is really something that is a very recent perspective. And Pebo's work really helps us understand our place in nature and how we ought to consider it more carefully. In a way, it's funny to contrast the far-reaching implications of such thoughts with the down and dirty experiments that Svante Pebo started with when he burnt livers and ground them up and saw whether he could extract just a little bit of DNA from them as he began this process of working out how you could reconstruct the degraded DNA of samples that had lain around for thousands of years. That contrast is one of the fun things about, I think, this conversation, that as you listen to the specifics of the research, bear in mind the truly groundbreaking nature of the implications of his results. This is Nobel Prize Conversations. Our guest is Svante Perbo, recipient of the 2022 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. He was awarded the prize for his discoveries concerning human evolution. By managing to sequence the genomes of our extinct relatives, the Neanderthal and the Denisovan, he unearthed unknown links between us and them. Your host is Adam Smith, Chief Scientific Officer at Nobel Prize Outreach. This podcast was produced in cooperation with Fundación Ramón Areces. Svante Perbo is the founding director of the Department of Genetics at the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology in Leipzig. He's also an adjunct professor at Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology. In this conversation, you'll hear him talk about how his mother set him up on his path by encouraging his interest in archaeology and how he discovered an unknown human species in a tiny piece of bone. But first, let's hear from the next generation. To take you back to Nobel Week, let's listen to your daughter Freya being interviewed at the banquet. It's quite intense for your dad right now. (laughs) What does he think of all this? Oh, he's mostly like really happy, but sometimes he's a tiny bit stressed because like he kind of doesn't always have free time. Like oh, so like he's always on the computer or something like that. But now that he like did his speech and everything, so now most of it is like gone, so still really cool. He can sort of relax. Yes. (laughs) She would be so proud. Oh good. Okay. Well she spoke very well. But in terms of the load that has been imposed upon you by receiving the prize. How have you found that? I mean, it has eased up since the Nobel Week, of course. What is slightly stressful is all the invitations and suggestions for activities I get. And I, of course, have to say no to almost everything. And you feel a little bad when they say no all the time. Also to invitations that, you know, a year ago I would have been happy to say yes to. But I am becoming rather callous and hard with it and say no to almost everything. That presumably is very important. That is the primary thing you need to learn as you become sought after, however it happens. And the Nobel just adds to that, I guess, yes. Yes, I sort of still have the ambition to do some of my real work still. Listen off. Absolutely, absolutely. (laughs) Of course, uh, your work involves very much future-facing technologies, state-of-the-art genetics and genomics, but it all comes out of an interest in the past, which is, I think, rooted in childhood. And I wondered if you could talk just a little bit about that interest in archaeology and digging around in the far distant past that developed when you were young. Well, I think it's probably started as a sort of fascination with archaeology that many kids probably have. And I was fortunate to live in Stockholm, where there are actually around Stockholm, there are places, you know, there's lots of ancient remains and places where people lived during the Stone Age. And 
I, with time, got a bit sophisticated and found out where there were Stone Age settlements. And then, for example, in Falls, when there had been big storms and trees tip over, I would go around and look in the roots where there were lots of uh, soil that had come up for old potsherds and things like that and collected things. What was the best thing you ever found? It is actually on an island outside Stockholm, there was a site where I found a l lots of potsherds and could puzzle them together <laughs> to a rather big piece of, of the pot that was around 3,000, 3,200 years old. And was absolutely fascinating to me yeah. that you could see these things that someone had done so long ago. You could see sometimes fingerprints in the clay or the pot. It's very tempting to think of that being the seed for piecing together other things, such as <laughs> genetic signatures oh, and whole genomes yes. in the future. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I still have that pot, man. It's a piece of a pot. And it's sort of amazing to me. And then it was really my mom who took me to Egypt when I was 13 or 14 or so, where it was really opened my eyes to how much is preserved there. It wasn't like you have to look for a pot shirt with great effort. There were places where the whole soil more or less was composed of the old shirts. Yeah. And that really then took off and it somehow didn't leave me that fascination. That must have been mind blowing to encounter such a place. Yes. So young, really. Well, yeah. What was the most memorable moment on that trip? I think it was really, for example, in southern Egypt on this island, Elephantina, where there was this realization that the whole earth was composed of, you know, at least 50% potters mm. in layers, right, where the older things were lowered down. And that there were lots of just yes, human remains too that were found every year in um, cemeteries, old cemeteries and things in Egypt. Svante Pebo was born in 1955. He grew up in a suburb of Stockholm with his mother, Karin Pebo, an Estonian-born chemist who came to Sweden as a refugee during the Second World War. His father was Swedish biochemist Suna Baristrom, who received the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine four decades before his son. But Svante was raised by his mother, who played a significant role in shaping his future career. It's interesting to talk about the influence of parents, always interesting. In your case, of course, there's been a lot of focus on the fact that your father was a Nobel laureate, but you always talk more about your mother. What did your mother do for you that was special in nurturing your interests? Well, first of all, I grew up as a single child of a single mom. Our father only visited us on Saturdays for a few hours. And I think my mom was a very strong woman who, who took my interest seriously too. So when I got interested in runic stones, we would on Saturdays and Sundays drive around and look at runic stones around Stockholm and I would measure them and copy the runes. Uh, so she really took time to sort of nurture those interests. That was perhaps an advantage of being a single kid to a single parent that she did have that time. I notice myself now that already when you just had two kids, you can't devote that much attention to just one of them, right? Absolutely, because yes, I'm one of a pair of parents, but of a single <laughs> kid. And I recognize very much, I was thinking how absolutely lovely for your mother <laughs> to have you to sort of go around and be excited with. If my child says, let's go do something together, it's the nicest thing in life. So she must have been absolutely thrilled to have you say, we need to go off and study runes oh, today, well. Mum. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and I do think that a single child of a single parent, you sort of have an even more symbiotic relationship mm. than typical you know, old family, where I can also see that one had almost other roles also for each other, you know. I would discuss things with my mom about should we get a new laundry machine, which type, should it be a more expensive or a cheaper one, things that we would never discuss Linda and I with our kids, right? They would not even notice there is a new laundry <laughs> machine installed. That one sort of was taken seriously rather early 
as an adult because they had these sort of multiple roles or is the other must. Makes you grow up quickly as well, I imagine. Or maybe not, maybe you consider yourself still very much a child in your yes, mind. Depends on what aspects of <laughs> the personality, probably. Yes, indeed. Well, your story is that Egyptology took hold and you thought that's where you might go into Egyptology, but then you, you switched away and moved into biology and medicine. What went wrong, if you like, with <laughs> the idea of being an archaeologist? <laughs> I do think that I probably had a far too romantic idea what it would mean to be an archaeologist or Egyptologist. So I sort of had this kind of childish fascination with it, imagining more or less that it would be excavating and finding amazing things every year. And at least as Egyptology was taught in, in uh, Uppsala, where I studied, it was a lot very linguistic. A large, large part of it was learning to read hieroglyphs and Coptic and things like that. And I worked two summers also at the Egyptological Museum in Stockholm. And the first summer was pretty fascinating, cataloging things and stuff like that. But then I sort of came back a year later and it was sort of the same people doing exactly the same thing, going for lunch at the same place, <laughs> gossiping about the same stuff. And somehow it seemed too slow moving for me. So I sort of was a bit disenchanted or I sort of realized I didn't see this as my future. And had a crisis of a sort, didn't know what to do. And then ended up saying, okay, I study medicine because at least to get a job. Mm. after that. But I think I had an eye towards doing research in medicine also already from the beginning, actually. But remarkably, um, I don't know, again, mature to see that kind of aspect of academia, of, you know, or rather departmental life, which I suppose plagues many places, so young and to recognize it and think I don't want to be part of that. Interesting. I mean, it's, it's funny to put it in these terms, because of course, the result of these decisions was that you ended up in a position to do amazing things. But then I suppose the same question about medicine that I asked about Egyptology, what, what was wrong with medicine that meant that you didn't go in that direction? <laughs> I think it was absolutely nothing wrong with medicine. I think I had imagined I would be fascinated by research. In fact, when I did the clinical courses in internal medicine and surgery and things like that, I discovered that I enjoyed seeing patients much more than I would have expected to. And then had another little crisis of sort saying, shall I become a doctor or shall I do research? And I said, okay, I take a break and do a PhD and I can always come back hmm. and finish my medical courses. And that's where we still are today. I haven't quite come back yet. But <laughs> I'm sure they'd welcome you back with open arms. <laughs> yes, okay. As a PhD student, then, obviously something took hold. An idea took hold, gradually. You never know where ideas come from, I suppose, but how, how did the idea take hold? Well, I think in this case, it's pretty obvious that what I learned as a PhD student were the techniques that at that time were rather novel of how you can extract DNA from an organism, modify it or stick it in bacteria and multiply the bacteria and then determine DNA sequences from lots of different organisms and compare the DNA sequences and make inference about the evolutionary history, how these organisms are related. And I knew, of course, from my studies of Egyptology that there were thousands and thousands of mummies around, of human mummies and animal mummies in Egyptological collections. So it seemed a rather obvious idea to say, can we apply these techniques to old tissues and find DNA that survived in them? And I think most people at the time thought that DNA was very, very sensitive, that there would be enzymes that very rapidly degrade it after death, things like that. Uh, but I guess Fortunately, I was rather ignorant of all that and just started trying it. <laughs> I was able to show that you could see in tissues from ancient Egyptian mummies that are then two, three thousand years old. You could sort of see histologically in the microscope cell nuclei, and you could also stain them for DNA. So it seemed to be some DNA preserved there. And then I try to extract the DNA, try to clone it in bacteria to study DNA sequences. 
and got some DNA sequences out. And among those were some that were clearly of human origin that I then thought came from the mummy mm-hmm. and even published that. But in hindsight, then over the next years, it became clear that they were very unlikely or not likely at all to actually come from the mummy because they were rather long. It became clear that DNA is very degraded to short little pieces. And then we sort of started a long process of working out uh, techniques to reliably retrieve DNA that from old tissues. So Svante Perbu's first attempt at extracting DNA from mummies failed, even if he wasn't aware of it at the time. Can you explain what happened, Adam? Well, probably the sample was simply contaminated. He was looking to amplify and then sequence DNA from the mummy. But as we know from all those um, TV series about forensics, the world is littered with DNA from all sorts of different sources. And mummies, which have been kicking around for a long time, have been touched by many people. So it could have been his own DNA on there as well, or the DNA of anything else that had touched the mummy over the years. And he uh, probably just ended up mistakenly sequencing a bit of stray DNA from elsewhere. Part of his work as he went on was to find ways of making sure that the samples he was working with were super pure. So how did he eventually manage to extract DNA from old tissue? Well, he found brilliantly ways of reconstructing extremely degraded DNA. The tissue he's working on has been around for thousands of years. It's been dried and frozen and goodness knows what else. And the DNA has become very broken up. And through painstaking efforts over a long period of time, he developed ways of piecing that DNA back together again and being able to eventually recover the entire genome of the organisms he was studying. What is a genome? A genome is simply the collected DNA of an organism. So it's all the DNA instructions within the organism that tell it what it is going to become. And Svante Perbu received his Nobel Prize for his discoveries concerning the genomes of extinct homonyms and human evolution. What is a homonym? A homonym? (laughs) And how am I supposed to say it? (laughs) Exactly, a homonym. Some kind of concatenation of M's and N's that makes it very hard. It's a tongue twister. It's a tongue twister. A homonym is the group of species that include us, Homo sapiens, and all our close ancestral relatives. So homonyms include species we already knew quite a lot about, like Neanderthals, species we knew nothing about, like the Denisovans that uh, Svante Pebo's research has discovered. So it's interesting to listen to Svante Pebo describe how he got from that uh, position of <laughs> failing to sequence DNA from mummies to being able to produce these entire genomes. Uh, let's listen to him talk about the start of that work. So the first thing I did to see if it at all would have a chance was to buy a piece of liver in the food store close to the Institute and just dry it in the the laboratory to somehow imitate mummification in ancient Egypt. And from that sort of artificially mummified piece of liver, then I could easily extract DNA. It was quite degraded actually. But it was lots of DNA surviving there. So that sort of gave me some confidence in that it's not that the DNA get totally degraded, you know, within hours after death that many of us thought would be the case. So that was sort of what led me on to then try it, also on older tissues. And then as I was working with this, there was another group at Berkeley, Alan Wilson, who was a very famous evolutionary geneticist that published some DNA sequences from a quagga, from the dried skin of a quagga, which is an extinct form of the sevra. So those tissues were about 100 years old, but that sort of encouraged me Mm. also very much. It's interesting that you didn't take what you were told as absolute written truth. You had to go out and find out for yourself. And You know, the the liver experiment shows shows an inquisitiveness, which is special, I think. Yeah, sometimes I have to say that of both inherent part of doing research is actually to almost take a delight in showing that what people think is wrong, right? That's a received wisdom. It's not how things are. Indeed, indeed. What did your PhD supervisor think of this direction of research? Well, at the time when I started this, 
I had rather big respect of him, so I would not tell him about this. So this <laughs> sort of was done secretly in the lab. Just some of my friends among the students would know about it. Some other people found out it be- about it because that liver started smelling pretty badly after a while. <laughs> and then only when the results were there and I was writing a manuscript about it, then of course I went and talked to my supervisor about it and he was very supportive then. Yeah, sort of encourage me to go on. Nice. That's exactly how it should be, isn't it? Yes. And it may be good not to tell your supervisor from the beginning and get discouraged. <laughs> so how do you promote that sort of environment in your own lab amongst your own students? I mean, I hope I promote it by sort of showing that it's not that I have much better insights than anyone else, right? I am as often wrong as other people in the group are wrong about what they think. It must be difficult to differentiate people trying out things that really do seem to you bonkers and just you know, not worth pursuing, and those who are, who are going down interesting lines but nothing's happening. You know, it, yes. how, do you, how do you draw the line? I mean, ideally you have a sort of open enough atmosphere so people are not afraid to bring up ideas that may be crazy. And then my role or the roles of other people in the group will be sort of more to discourage certain ideas that are really bonkers and sort of say things that might be right that one can give it a try, right? To sort of sieve out the sort of good ideas among many, many ideas. So from those early beginnings, you remarkably managed eventually to produce the genome of the Neanderthal. There's a lot we've skipped over Perfect. there, but were you immensely surprised that you got to that end point? Or did you feel, even from those early beginnings, that you were going to get there one day? It was just, of course, a gradual process over 25, 30 years, right? With small advances. I think when we first got the first little pieces of Neanderthal DNA that comes from this mitochondrial genome that exists in many copies, so it's much easier to retrieve. I was sort of amazed that that worked. And I think for a couple of years, one was thinking we would never be able to get to the whole nuclear genome to get to single copy genomes, part of the genome, which are men, much, much less prevalent. But it's, of course, a step-by-step thing where technology advances, you start thinking this might work, so you try things. Uh, so, of course, by 2004 or five, I was convinced that, in principle, much should be able to do it if one had enough resources and um, had sort of technological advances that you could see on the horizon coming. Mm. And then I was very fortunate that we sort of worked did convince the people there to then give us money to attempt to do that. It must, I suppose, have become quite a competitive field over the course of those years. I mean, obviously, it's not the same as the Human Genome Project, but towards the end, that became such a race and people had so much vested interest in in getting there first. Uh And, And was there a similar feeling in your project? There were aspects of it that was competitive. I mean, there was one other group that we initially worked together with that then had different ideas about how one would do this, that one would actually clone DNA in bacteria rather than doing it all in vitro. And we didn't believe in that. And then we sort of went different ways and it became a bit competitive. But I have never sort of felt that competition is a primary driving force of anything like that. No. It is, of course, an aspect of this working with ancient remains that uh, an important part is getting access to the good specimens. So that can get competitive Mm -hmm. sometimes. There are now fortunate developments in the field, for example, where one has now realized that one can even use the sediments from archaeological excavations to retrieve DNA from the people who have lived at the cave site. <laughs> so not working with bones anymore. And then, of course, the material is not limiting anymore. There's sort of unlimited amounts of that material. 
which is also a relief, right? It's sort of not that you have to compete for the one bowl necessary that is found at the place. Well, I was thinking this because when you discovered the Denisovans from a tiny piece of finger bone from a cave, I was, yes, wondering how that piece of finger bone came to you, to your lab. To, <laughs> and you had the good sense to think that was worth investigating. So. Yes, I mean, we worked with the Russian groups that excavated that cave since, since quite some time. So they gave it to us, but we initially thought, ah, this is so small, it's not very interesting. It lay around for at least half a year before we got around analyzing it, actually. Right. And that's sort of one of the things that is still a big mystery in the field, why certain bones can be a very good preservation. That little bone, in terms of DNA, you know, has very much endogenous DNA preserved. Other bones from, you know, the same layer, just a meter away at the site, are much less well preserved. They do contain DNA, but much, much less. And that's something we still don't understand. How very interesting. It sort of is. It probably has to do with how much water percolation or things that have been over tens of thousands of years or so. And this point you make about being able to retrieve DNA samples from sediment, of course, this must be a huge crossover with forensic science now in just in the modern world in crime fighting. It's extraordinary, isn't it, that you can piece together things from from what one would have thought was almost nothing. Yes. I mean, the conditions have to be right. For example, the soil can't be acidic. So say limestone caves are ideal because it's sort of basic conditions. But when it works, it's really amazing. You can sort of retrieve from different layers, see what humans have been there. It's still, of course, true that if you want to determine a high quality genome from a single individual, you will need a well-preserved bone. But to reconstruct the population history of a site, sediment DNA is amazing. There's so many avenues to go down when thinking about what these genomes that you've revealed tell us. The phrase that uh, I think is used in the press release for the Nobel Prize you received by the committee is it helps us understand what makes us uniquely human. <laughs> does that chime with you? And, and, and in what, what sense does it help us understand who we are to know what the genome of the Neanderthal or the Denisovan would be? A different level to think about this, I think, is sort of, of course, what has happened is that thanks to having the genomes from our closest evolutionary relatives, we can estimate when we have the common ancestor with them in order of half a million years ago or so. We have also discovered the fact that uh, many of us today, those of us who have their genetic roots in Europe or Asia or anywhere outside Sub-Saharan Africa, have a component in our genome that comes from Neanderthals and we live in Asia in addition from the Nisibans, and that those contributions from them have biological consequences today, the variants that have come from them and some of us carry. The same will surely be true in Africa. Also, I think when one finds human is able in the future to retrieve genomes from extinct forms of humans in Africa. Then there's another level of this where one can say what makes us uniquely modern human or then genetic changes that happened since we separated from Neanderthals half a million years ago spread to everyone so that everyone has those changes today or most of us. And that's an area that's just beginning to be explored. Actually, You can sort of make a catalog of such changes and this in the order of 34 thousand changes or so, and then try to start looking, as we and some others do, on the biological consequences of all those changes. But I think the direction it is going is probably to be, say, that there is sort of going to be a combination of those that may be important for some aspects of being a fully modern human, and I hope one will understand more of that in the next few years. But it may even be the case that none of such changes is in themselves sort of a key change that is absolutely necessary. It may probably will be a combination of those things. But that's really a challenge for the next five or ten years to try to find out those things. Yes, I suppose so much of biology is about finding out what we have in common 
with the rest of the living world, all the other yes, animals and yeah. plants. And it's a different way of looking at things to say, okay, how do these 30,000 changes make us different? Very interesting. And it's very challenging because... For definition, those things vary very little. There are very few people who don't carry these changes. That's how we define them. So it's quite challenging to find out what they really cause because we can't easily as compare people with and without those changes. No. So we will have to use model organisms or engineer these changes into cells using you know, all this CRISPR-Cas9 technology that was awarded another well-deserved prize a few years ago, etc. Is there yet an example, though, that you can call upon that says this is... Yeah, so we've begun to study in collaboration with a group to study brain development in rest and uh, some of these changes. And it turns out that a combination of changes in two genes affect how accurate chromosomes are pulled apart in early brain development in stem cells that generate neurons that if we engineer in the ancestral state, Neanderthal ape-like state, there are more errors in how the chromosomes segregate. That's very interesting. It probably results in that cells with these errors in segregation actually die. If that then has consequences for the adult brain is another question that one needs to explore. One other change in an enzyme, TKTL1, for example, in the ancestral state results in fewer neurons being born. But again, these are changes that we now can study because they happen very early in, in brain development that you can model in the laboratory in tissue culture. Hmm. And it's unclear what consequences those would have in the adult individuals. But one is beginning to sort of find some of these things. There is one other change in an enzyme that takes care of oxidative radicals, a sort of damaging side products of metabolism in all cells in the body. The other modern human version seems to be better in terms that it more efficiently takes care of these oxidative radicals because particularly there are very few of them there. And there is actually some people carry the ancestral state today as result of gene flow from Neanderthals, but less than, you know, one in 10,000 or so in Europe. And then we can see that that associates with a slight increased risk of having diseases that have to do with inflammation that may be caused by this radical, so arterial sclerosis, inflammatory bowel disease, things. So one is beginning to learn some things about mm -hmm. these things. Fascinating. The coexistence with Neanderthals People talk about the fact that, uh, or you have t spoken about the fact that Homo sapiens and Neanderthals interbred. What form did, do you think, from your genetic evidence, did interbreeding between the two populations take? Well, I think something that's striking to me is that when one now starts to look at the genomes of very early modern humans in Europe, where one has most data, so from modern humans that lived at a time when they could have met or their immediate ancestors could have met Neanderthals. Then very many of them, I think we have probably in the order of seven such individuals today, and at least five of them have close Neanderthal relatives in their family histories in the last 10 generations or so. So if we look at these very early modern humans that come, they seem to have interbred very often with Neanderthals. And only later does it seem to come modern humans that sort of replace Neanderthals so that they disappear. So I think that probably part of the story about why Neanderthals disappeared may have been that they've simply been absorbed into larger modern human populations that came, that modern humans were more numerous. And how this happened is, of course, anybody's guess. I sometimes <laughs> joke and say it says much more about your views of humanity and how we are as human beings, how you speculate about this, than anything about what happened back then, because we truly don't know. It. <laughs> we could speculate about anything, really. What's your individual speculation? I try to stay away from speculation. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's... 
it is striking to me that it seems to have been very frequent. So I wouldn't think that it's all something very bad and violent or something like that. Mm. A large part of why Neanderthals disappeared may simply have been that the population has fused. I'm afraid it is entirely in the realm of speculation, but it is interesting to speculate on how the two populations viewed each other. I mean, we can't have any insight into that, but how different did they see each other as being? And I suppose then, you know, by extension, what does that tell us about how we view the rest of the world today? I mean, it's not as if the concept of species was sort of uppermost in their minds, perhaps, but in terms of, I don't know, something like tolerance, it seems an interesting thing to ponder on. Yes, I mean, you must regard each other as rather similar if you frequently sort of have kids together, right? Mm. You can't regard this other a totally sort of alien. And, you know, sometimes I say it's sort of interesting to speculate, you know, Neanderthals were here, say, 2,000 generations ago. It's not tremendously long ago. If they would have made it another 2,000 generations, how would we have dealt with them? Would they live in Zeus or would they live in suburbia? <laughs> would we see, you know, even worse racism against them today because they were truly in some ways a bit different? Or would it rather have blurred this very clear distinction we so easily make between humans and animals? If it would have other forms of humor, if it still had sort of using tools and using having communication by being quite different, we may not have had this quite limited view mm. of what it is to be a human. Who knows? I mean, it's only speculation, right? Only speculation, but valuable and fascinating speculation. And, and I may be pushing it too far because we can't tell too much, but just the common view of Neanderthals as being, I suppose, a subspecies, you know, not, not having produced art, for instance, and perhaps not being as brilliant as their cousins. Do you think that holds up? I think it's a big debate among paleontologists and archaeologists where... I think the sort of trend goes to recognizing more and more abilities in the Neanderthals. It is still, of course, true that somehow it is modern humans in the end that become so numerous, spread over the whole world, and eventually develop technology and things that change so rapidly. In my view, there has to be some difference there. It may not necessarily be that you're individually on the average smarter as a modern human than a Neanderthal or something like that. Could also have something to do with sociality or so. Modern humans seem to form larger communities and larger populations, so maybe it's something social that distinguishes us. And maybe having larger societies make for more innovation or rapid cultural change, for example. Maybe we will understand something of that one day. Mm. It's arguable that the progress of the world isn't entirely linear, that the, the most brilliant and accomplished always choose the direction that the countries are going to go in, <laughs> that societies are going to go in. So we can't, be, we can't be sure that that's what was happening back then, I suppose. Mm -hmm. I suppose. Yes. You've been running an institute since 1997 to build something that truly reflects your vision of how research should be done must not be easy or you rather say it's a great privilege to be able to implement some of your ideas i mean i think it was almost a historically unique situation in eastern germany when after reunification there was the ambition and the resources to build up a research infrastructure to you know, similar level as in Western Germany in terms of per population, so to say. So it was really a chance to start several new institutes, and this was one of them where we then sort of asked the question, how would we study human history and human evolution if we started from scratch <laughs> without looking at any traditional ways of doing it? And it was, yes, a unique chance in life to do that. To be given a tabula rasa like that, extraordinary, yeah. And do you think you've been successful? I hope so. I mean, I, I have the feeling that this institute has been slightly copied since then at other places in the world. So the idea was to bring together 
different disciplines, no matter if they are traditionally seen as humanities or sciences, as long as they are empirical, as long as they build or collecting data, testing the data statistically. If you do that, you can talk to each other, no matter if you're a linguist or archaeologist or, or a geneticist. And to some extent, I do think it has been successful. That's very important. So much happens on the kind of interface between disciplines. It's so important to be able to have common language and mm -hmm. common conversation. If people wanted to get a picture of your institute, would you say that that little video that's gone viral of you being thrown into the pond in the middle of the institute, having been, having been awarded the prize, <laughs> captures the spirit? Students throwing their, their leader in, into the pond? <laughs> mm, I hope so, yes. <laughs> Good. It's very kind of you to have taken time to speak to me. Thank you. Okay, thanks. You just heard Nobel Prize Conversations. If you'd like to learn more about Svante Pirbo, you can go to nobelprize.org, where you'll find a wealth of information about the prizes and the people behind the discoveries. Nobel Prize Conversations is a podcast series with Adam Smith, a co-production of FILT and Nobel Prize Outreach. The producer for this episode was Karin Svensson. The editorial team also includes Andrew Hart, Olivia Lindquist, and me, Claire Brilliant. Freya Vigilant was interviewed by Victoria Deering. Music by Epidemic Sound. At the Max Planck Institute, Nobel laureates are plentiful. Listen to our conversations with Benjamin List, Klaus Hasselmann, Emmanuel Charpentier, and Hartmut Mikkel. You can find previous seasons and conversations on ACAST or wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks for listening.